Hello and most welcome to 761, our H series. We are once more here at the local library in Borgorda and night has already struck us. The sun's going down. It will take a while in January before we get this sliding of the day. Just now there is getting longer, but we are approaching the brighter period of the year. And speak about brightness. What happens if we look at something at a distance? What does become of it? Well, it tends to get more obscure and usually the colors go to the blue. This is the bluish shade you will always see when you look in the horizon. And this is what I would like to start with because we have earlier spoke about this distancing, putting in something in between. And I will try to trace it and that term is something I deliberately will take up later. I would like to trace it and I want you to remember the term trace. Spore in Swedish. Well, what happens? Uh, we will make a short recap. We talked about Richard E. Lind and how we historically went up in the head and it was this de development of reflective consciousness and we lose the firmness of the stability of the world at the same time as we lose our capability of thinking and also the mental aspects of ourselves. And this is wanting to focus on only one part, but it's a whole, so we lose the whole part. Somewhere one can also return this as you pointing to something and you forgetting the other thing. This is Swedish for man and woman. This is a very well-known polarity between the two. One thing goes into the foreground and the other one slides into the background. One gets the light of spring and the other one slides into the obscurity of winter. <clears throat> this is also a happening in distancing or we tend to say it's the only prior it's only the prioritized thing that has full presence the other one is not present it's absent and that goes both in space, it's longer away, but it's also in the past. It used to be. Because if you do a comparison and say, I prioritize this, already you said that the other one is in the past. It's not here anymore. And this is this very, very tricky thing of putting something into order, ordinals. And this is a tendency that is very hard to really, really point at because at the same moment you point at it, it seems to disappear. Or worse, you are constructing something new that you're prioritizing. Something I would say is happening now, especially in the US on the West Coast, where people are making a topsy-turvy turn of all concepts that were usually so prevalent. And I'd say in this process of distancing, there are two aspects that get lost at the same time. The one aspect is exactness and distinctiveness and the other one is more wholesome, holistic, global, the whole picture. 
And what is happening in modern time is we are losing both sides, both the exactness and we are also losing the whole picture. We are stranding in a fixed way of thinking, somewhere in between, but we don't really have the option to change that. We are always stuck in that. And we mentioned that first a couple of lectures ago. No, I think it was like more 50 lectures ago. Uh, it's often meant as, uh, uh, mentioned as universalism, generality, and also hum homogeneous thinking. That everything is similar. So you see here, the similarity lies in that nothing is really distinct and nothing is neither really universal or holistic, not the whole thing. It's neither. But there is a wish for exactness. And we mentioned that when we spoke about Plato and Dana Dennett, they are wanting something, they are lacking something. They know in the, at their heart something is not present anymore. And this is this wish for full presence. It's like a compensation for what is lost. And we know this is something that makes it worse, much worse. That's going in the wrong direction. So you feel a lack somewhere and you try to fix it and the fixing makes it even worse. A bit exaggerated, I think many people woke up New Year's Day and they felt really bad because they've been drinking a lot. And um, what do they do? Well, let's drink some more and maybe it will pass. That will actually make it much worse. And I argue for the tendency that, that this is, I won't name it yet, but this tendency makes everything worse in the long run. And one of the reasons that doesn't discover, get discovered, it's that this tendency, because of the striving, the wish to fix everything directly, looking for the felt full presence, and it should be here, and it should be directly, it shouldn't take any time, that will actually lock you in a model where you don't even understand that you had other opinions before or that things were different. This is what we usually call eradicating the past. You have no longer any memory. Another way of seeing this tendency is that we often today put an addendum, a PM, and in Swedish called Brasklapp, we add something, and this is the philosopher I want to take up today. We haven't spoken on, about him for a long time. That's the French philosopher Jacques Derrida. And he spoke about something called the supplement, the supplement. So first you have fullness, you're not aware of it. You think it's lacking somewhere and you want to have something extra. This extra specificity the prioritizing, the marginalization, this extra is going to give you what you are lacking, what do you really want to have in your heart. And this wishing we can trace all the way back to the Greek, and something we talked about. But the interesting thing is the way how they tried to fix it. It made it worse. They added something to something that is already complete and then instead of making something even more incomplete, they introduced an original lack. This thing is on stilt. It has a handicap device, a prosthetic to help it. And this is very reminiscent with the reflective consciousness, because it's something extra. It's something more than your body and mind. 
Reflective consciousness is a supplement and it's a supplement that actually tells you in the long run that it's a lack somewhere. And this striving for the supplement and adding that constantly is this we can trace all the way back as the look for the ephemeral, the non-material, the ideal, the platonic forms somewhere above. Not here. And we make a division. In the look for clarity, we make divisions. And that's another way of making a supplement. You divide everything somehow. And what we talked a lot about is the findings of Sarah Feldman Barrett that it was instigated already in antiquity that emotions were something hidden somewhere. The inventions of the emotions, the invention of the emotions meant that a part of you was untouchable. That was gone in darkness. That was your instincts, the things you couldn't help. And by creating something dark and uncontrollable, thereby could the ancient thinker invent the light, an artificial light, I would call it. And that was the invention of rationality. And you can see how they are dependent on each other. It's the same tendency as here. We first create a division and say, here you have one part and here you have another part. And then you prioritize one part and you marginalize the other one. This is the logocentric turn, the logocentric striving. And it's only one thing that's fully present. It's only one that it's in here, in here, in the now. The other one is in the past. And that goes for the emotions. And after the creation, creation of the emotions, we forgot about them because we, they were pushed aside. They were in the margins, exactly. So if you wrote a book or something, the thought was that your emotions, there was something you kept for yourself and was something that you actually govern your action. That's the weird thing. By being pushed aside, it grew also more powerful in another way. It didn't disappear. It made its appearance. And the more you pressed it away, the more it turns up. And this is very similar to if you have a ball that's just too big, like think of this size ball filled with air, and you try to push it underwater. The more you push, the more it pulls up. And this is the same thing with emotions. After the creation of emotions, after the marginalizations of the emotions, they become more predominant. And we got ruled by emotions. They were the ones taking over the prioritized thing because they were codependent. And the thing in the darkness is the thing that we cannot control. And I also mention in this happening, this movement, there is also a trace of fear somewhere. Because by putting something into the darkness, it becomes dangerous, weird, odd. It shouldn't be there. And then somewhere you start to fear it. And this fear is what, what, is what go, it is what's going to drive you in the end. This is what's going to be the fuel for philosophy since antiquity. Trying to get rid of something, starting to fearing it, making it 
bigger and bigger thereby. It's a stack rate unknown. And of course, this could be with a bipolar relationship between man and woman. Woman is pushed aside and become dangerous. It becomes almost like Eve is the evil one, taking the apple from the tree of knowledge. Fear her, take her away, uh, marginalize her. She is dangerous. She is also emotional. You see the connection here? For some weird reason, they get the marginalized things in this division. And usually in the divisions that are made later, one part or one side take all the marginalized things and the other part takes the all prioritized thing. So you see this is a sort of a game, it's a construction. And it's very similar to the reflective consciousness because it says more or less that the body is something lower. The body is not as good as the reflective consciousness. And then you get further and further and someone will say, maybe a thousand years later, that the body is even bad, doesn't do anything, just to upheld the mind somewhere. And then in the end you get rid of the body completely with a uh, turn into rationality. Everything becomes logic, rationality, and as all these bipolar division, they can turn over directly without any real effect. And we mentioned that another lecture, and it was this turn. You went from being completely rational, we had rationalism, especially uh, within mathematics, and then it turns the other way around. The same happened within philosophy. We, want, we went, especially here in Sweden, uh, until the year 1903, 1904, uh, all the philosophical schools were idealistic. It was pure mind. And then it changed to all matter and nothing else. And that happened within with the time span of a couple of years. It's really weird. I don't think anywhere in the world a philosophical change ever happened that quickly. And I think that's suspicious in itself. And I would say they were actually the same thing, more or less. Even on paper, they were sworn enemies and they were constantly fighting each other. They were the same thing. Because the tendency of marginalization is exactly the same. If you're idealistic, you marginalize matter, but if you're materialist, you marginalize everything mental. And after that, we continue in the material way, and we went further and further. And I have one good stopping point, 1935-36 came a book, and then uh, the couple, uh, what's their name now? Mutal. Mm, Myrdal, yeah. Alva Myrdal called the Swedish people for material. She did actually. Population material. That was no coincidence. Uh, the couple was stern materialist. And actually they got their ideas from an even stronger tendency of analytical philosophy. Something that never caught attention in its uh, nascent country, uh, United States that become extremely popular here in Sweden, especially among the intellectuals. And she was calling people material. That's a bit scary. And in the continuation of that, we have, of course, Daniel Dennett, and he was especially invited to Sweden many times because he was so incredibly sane. And here we have the turnover to materialism. Nothing is mental. First we divide everything, then we try to cast out the other thing. It becomes the scapegoat for everything bad. Just as emotions for the Greek were something bad. All the irrational things we did, all the love we did, all the anger and hate we did, that has to be thrown out with the scapegoat. 
What to do with the scapegoat? Kick it. Well, in, in the end, they even killed the scapegoat. I don't know what they did with it. Horrific things. But this is very similar. And Derrida calls this the scapegoat tendency to have something to blame for all of that. And this is from the beginning a failed project because you split everything up. And adding stuff to the whole thing doesn't make anything any better. It does just the opposite. And I think the best addition is something I found myself. And that actually happened in Christianity. I don't remember the year. Of course, nothing happened in one exact year, but it's somewhere around turn of the millennia. Let's say 1066. I know that's the Battle of Hastings. I know it's not this year. But then something happened. And that's the Battle of Philoque. This was an addition, and this addition made a crack in Christianity, a chiasma. And I think it's very telling that just an addition, a supplement, as they would say, is what caused the crack. Some didn't like this addition and said it was unnecessary. It added something to something that was already 100% perfect, 100% present, 100% not present, 100% past, 100% not past. The addition could be looked upon as something suspicious. Suspicious. That is what uh, Derrida is warning us for. Look out with the addition. Look out with the supplement. Is it really needed? And I have a modern conception here. Uh, although I'm a very big admirer of different herbs and concussions and such things, and also healthy food. That is something that turned up a little bit before uh, uh, the last world war. And there was the discovery that certain illnesses were actually caused by deficits, a lack, a lack in something that was called vitamins. One was very prevalent, uh, its effects, uh, if you don't have it enough, its lack of bone structure, it's called rachitis. And I actually seen people with rachitis, it's very rare, uh, but they are actually suffering from lacking vitamin D. And then they found people who were lacking in vitamin C, Vitamin C lack is called scurvy and it's very frequent with the people who are sailing a lot because if you're sailing it's very hard to bring you things that actually contain vitamin C uh, and it's also one of those vitamins that are actually quite perishable. It cannot take air, it cannot take sun for instance. These ideas were completely correct but they led to the idea that uh, there was probably an original lack in vitamins in all places. Uh, so then we have this vitamin revolution. It started much later, but it started somewhat already there. People got vitamin injections, and they were large. I've seen one of those at the Museum of Medicine History. It was this size. It contains loads of vitamins. And those vitamins were supposed to be supplement to your dietary restrictions or something like that. Uh, I always was suspicious of that. How could it be that normal food that I'm accustomed to eat could lack something? Why should I take a supplement? Well, it turned turn out you don't. Nobody really needs to take any supplement. There are some small exceptions, maybe up here in the north, that's why I mentioned the lack of sunlight. We could need to take a supplement for vitamin D because we get so little sun. Vitamin D is the source. Uh, the sun is the source of vitamin D. But even in that case, it's not completely sure. 
Maybe I, who are not very exposed to the sun lately, maybe I need one or two. But it won't kill me not if I don't get it. But I sure as hell don't lack vitamin C, vitamin B, and so forth. So the idea that we are lacking, we are imperfect in some sense, it goes in all aspects. And uh, we start to think ourselves as very fragile. We can't take that, we can't take this. And I think by just thinking in the idea of an original lack, that lack comes up, becomes an idea. And the health industry, the one who's selling vitamin, are selling all over the place. And they're earning a fortune. And the fact is, they don't have to do much marketing. They just mention the thing because we are ingrained with this idea that we have an original lack somewhere. We need to take vitamins. Uh, especially babies used to be given loads of different stuff in their mouth. And I, I, I remember this, getting something into my eye. I don't remember much of it. I got something in my eye. Thank God they stopped that, but it really hurt. That eye potion was necessary, it felt like. Otherwise the babies would go blind or something. I don't know. We are adding way too much. So this is a general tendency. And I don't mean that taking away the supplement will heal everything. I don't think so. But what could lead to the, that the crack actually heals is to understand how it started. I think that's very necessary. Why is very hard to tell. One could say one felt not whole at some instant. There was a trauma. Heidegger speak about amnesia. There are different explanations. Maybe they are, are maybe can never be explained. That we settle with something happened. But we need to know how this additioning works. And this is actually what Derrida did. He showed everywhere how the need for different helping aids to helping the text. Uh, I actually got this idea from uh, Kalle suggested to use uh, Grammarly. And I noticed I, I put actually everywhere in the text. I would say actually is uh, pretends to full presence, but actually means full presence. It's like I'm pointing to something I already said, an unnecessary repetition. And what it does in the long run is making the text more fragile. This addition doesn't add anything. Just like the vitamins, they don't add anything. But whereas the vitamins, it doesn't matter. You can take your vitamins. No, nobody will get hurt, only your wallet. But in this case, you instigate the idea that there is a lack somewhere. And I think that idea sticks in the end. And it becomes your destiny to go into the wrong direction, to look for things in a place where they are not. Just like Plato's cave or uh, as in uh, our good friend, uh, our scapegoat, uh, René Descartes, who felt that by cutting off his body even more, he would save the world or himself or something like that. And Daniel Daniel for that matter, who cut himself off whole body-wise. Uh, somebody called that a whole body lobotomy or whole body abortion. I think that was actually uh, Alvin Plantinga, but I'm not sure about uh, the reference there. I need to check it out. But it's very well put. Uh, he, fe he felt that he solved the whole problem by taking himself away. And the supplement is also a disjunction in time. When you add something start out with a wholeness and you add something a plus is also a disjunction in time because as Heidegger says we always already been here 
everything is perfect from the beginning. Here we add something, we do that later. And that's a disjunction in time. And this is, I would say, causality as is modernly perceived. Derrida also goes into causality and the problem with causality. It's an addendum, something after everything already happened. And uh, the striving for full presence is because in your idea of getting to the juicy part, you create cause of effect, you being constantly late in your own reality, you not being in the position of experience reality, and then you start feeling a lack, and then this lack has to be compensated with a full presence in the text. And whereas the text actually has everything, it contains everything, you start thinking, it's not enough, we need to add something, we need to add meaning to the text. And you start adding something, you will add something where you can add. And in the end, you add something you yourself do not understand. It's ununderstandable. It's something you don't even know what it is. It cannot have a purpose. Nothing can have a purpose outside the wholeness. And it started for the wrong reason. A sense of anything lacking when everything is whole is wrong. There is no lack. Nothing is missing. And this I'm going to get back tomorrow, but this is this idea that we're not conscious. And part of the idea of dividing everything into a conscious part, well, I call that rationality, as I usually, but can also be seen as a conscious part. And then you want to get rid of the unconscious. And when you do that, you forget you've made a division. That's the amnesia. You divide the whole thing, you turn it into something ontic. So every time you try to make something more conscious, you make it less conscious. And you start, stop realizing almost immediately that the conscious is absolutely dependent on the unconscious. They are codependent. They are part of one and the same thing. And by trying to make everything completely present, completely here and now, you lose it at the same time. You are weakening the text from within. So whereas the supplement tries to weaken, the, uh, does weaken the text from the outside, the presence, the, the idea of the full presence, is weakening the text from the inside. And it does so via polarization, marginalization. In the text, you try to make something stronger, which is already very strong. Yeah. Yes, Claude Lévi-Strauss published a famous book called The Raw and the Cooked. Ah. And uh, Derrida uh, pointed out that uh, Lévi-Strauss made two mistakes. For the first, uh, that he created a polarity between raw and cooked, and that uh, uh, Liv Strauss also implied that there was a lack oh, yeah, in yeah. the 80s peoples, as if, uh, since they only had raw food, as if they lacked cooked food, which is the sign of civilization. Uh, so that was the and, that, and that can be turned upside down, as it did with uh, Rousseau who imply that was, there was some lacking in civilized man, whereas uncivilized man had this original wholeness here and now somewhere. And this tendency is very clear, but it can be very hard to spot sometimes. And this is what is so compelling and so interesting with Erda, because he opens up a new field, and there's always new things to discover. And the discovery is not only with something outside yourself, with a text or some author, some philosopher, it's also within yourself. Because if you read a text and there is an experience of a lack somewhere, it's both in the text and you. That's a necessary requirement. And Derrida goes to heal the text, but at the same time, also you get healed. <laughs> I think we...
we heard the book by Marjola, and he said that deconstruction is actually healing for the individual as well. Because if you find marginalization, it's not only the text and the author that's trying to marginalize, you do it yourself. You, uh, you have to have some hint of logocentrism to experience the whole thing, whatever it is, if it's anything. It's very hard to tell. But uh, I just would like to mention a few things I found here that could be conceived as logocentric. Well, yeah, not longer than I thought. And one here is trying to find facts in the world by presencing, looking for presence. Mm. And what is knowledge? The philosopher are Greek. This is not a philosophy book, but the author Osa Wikfors goes to the philosophers. The conviction need to be true, you need to have it, and it also need to be based on evidence and facts. So they have three terms to have truth. I would say having all three is an addendum, it's a supplement. Of course, this is because you don't trust reality anymore. You add those things. It doesn't make any sense that you should look for evidence when you already know what's true. This is also putting an addendum somewhere, trying to fix something that's already there. We know what's true. It's just that we lost maybe the sense of it, the wholeness. But once we become whole, we will have truth once more in our bodies and in our minds. But I'd say this way of going about things is putting in an addendum, an extra thing. And that's why I think epistemology really taking the piss to have a joke, epistemology. And the, the thing is, it tries to prove how we know things. So it actually assumes the thing we already have. And that's like a cat biting itself in the tail. We never, ever question what we have. We know what we know. And to question that is a, is a rather strange addendum. And even the analytical philosopher objects to that. I think Ormond Quine is the most prevalent example of that. But also William James. Well, he's a pragmatic. He thought it was phony knowledge and a phony knowledge part epistemology. Uh, I think I round out there and uh, glad to get back to the subject but nice to see Monsieur Derrida once more and I say thank you very much. Well I, I tell a French joke. How many people does it take to defend Paris? I don't know. Uh, German division. I don't know because it's never been done. <laughs> okay thank you very much.